This is BBC One in the North. Now, look north with Mike Neville. A hundred million pound plan puts Teesside at the leading edge of science. Two mining unions fall out over a redevelopment scheme for vain tempests. And while the parents are paying the bills in Cumbria schools. Good evening. First, some news just in. Nearly 300 people have been evacuated from the Thorpe reprocessing plant at Sellafield this afternoon. British nuclear fuel say a small number of people are receiving medical checks. The Thorpe plant only began testing with nuclear material for the first time last week. But in a statement issued in the last few minutes, BNF said there'd been a release of non-radioactive nitrogen oxides. Well, in our Carlisle studio now is the news editor of BBC Radio Cumbria, Andrew Hartley. Andrew, what more can you tell us about this incident? Mike, we know very little indeed. We've just received um, a press statement from BNFL within the last quarter of an hour. It tells us that around half past three this afternoon there was a release of nitrogen oxides, that's called NOx, into a localised area of the Thorpe plant that is currently undergoing reprocessing. That's the testing that was uh, allowed last week. The the plant was evacuated in the immediate vicinity, that's around 280 people, and some of those people, a small number of those people, are currently undergoing medical checks as a result of that leak, but we don't know the kinds of checks that are there undergoing. You don't know the condition of anybody affected? We don't as yet. I mean, all we have, literally, is the press release, the media release that we've just received. Well, this is very bad news for British nuclear fuels. How's it going to affect them, do you think? It's extremely embarrassing for BNFL. As I said earlier, just last week they were given permission uh, in the Court of Appeal to continue with this testing. They started that last Thursday and in fact next week there is a judicial review taking place at the High Court. The jobs of 700 people claim BNFL hang on the decision to allow them to continue with this uranium testing. This clearly is an embarrassment. It won't help BNFL as they continue with this process in the run-up to full commissioning at Thorpe, they hope, uh, perhaps in December. Andrew Hartley in Carlisle, thank you very much. Thank you. The Teesside Development Corporation has announced plans for what's called an energy research park on the banks of the River Tees. The £100 million cost will be largely funded by major companies in America, Japan and Europe. It will pioneer research into new forms of energy conservation. Construction will begin on the Teesdale site in Stockton later this year. Jim Knight reports. The model, proudly unveiled by the Development Corporation, shows the sheer scale of the development. The nine futuristic-looking pavilions will be built in their own landscaped grounds around a series of man-made lakes. The TDC says it'll be unique at the leading edge of research, eventually developing into an international centre of excellence. The concept of an energy park is somewhat difficult to grasp because it is a con it's based on research, uh, uh, and forward technology in, the, uh, in energy and energy conservation, but it will move from research into, into, um, into research and development and into manufacturing, and it will also have research links with major research and educational institutions throughout the world. So it is a significant international project. Looking at the derelict nine-acre site, it's hard to imagine that this could soon become a world centre for research and development in energy. But work on the new pavilions will start soon. The first is expected to be complete by autumn next year. Since the whole concept of what they're planning here is the promotion of energy conservation measures, so the construction of the buildings here will reflect that. Many will be glass fronted and some will be solar heated. And there'll be no standard cars allowed on the park either. The only vehicles which will be allowed on will be either battery or solar powered. The Development Corporation believes that by developing a research park at this time, it's captured the new challenge for industry, namely the production of clean energy. 
this question of the proper use of energy in our society is the dominant factor uh, affecting the civilization in the next century. If we can attract the base of that research and that development into Teesside, then we've set the seeds for Teesside to be at the center of the next industrial revolution and the next development in industry and uh, in the world. Just yards from where the new research park is to be built at the University College Stockton, they were delighted to hear about their new neighbors. Staff are already looking forward to joint research projects and sharing high-tech laboratories with industry. I think it's the, it's the potential for the expertise that's available in two parent, two parent institutions and in this institution we have uh, a number of highly qualified, um, very, very successful academics teaching environmental programs and a number of very good researchers as well. And of course, uh, if you can interface those with the, the real world in terms of industrial uh, collaboration, then we've got a real success on our hands, I think, for the future. The potential for new jobs, both immediately on the site itself and as an indirect result of work at the park, is enormous. The Development Corporation spoke conservatively today of creating several hundred jobs, but hinted at the park's potential to create many, many more. The Energy Park announcement was made during a visit to the region by Sir George Young, the Minister for Housing and Construction. He was here to see the latest stage of the Tees Barrage project. £50 million pounds is being spent on a scheme which will maintain the river at its high tide level and create development opportunities. It's been done by temporarily diverting part of the river in the top left-hand corner here, while the barrage was built on the original course of the Tees. The section sandwiched between the barrage has been dry during building work, but today the pumps were turned on to return the river to its original course, leaving the barrage to maintain the water level. David Morrison reports. Moses may have diverted the Red Sea, but the Development Corporation says it's going one better. Having diverted the Tees a year ago, it's now putting it back again, with the help of the Housing and Construction Minister, Sir George Young. The river was moved to allow dry work to begin on the barrage. Now that's complete, and millions of gallons of water will be pumped into the specially created dry dock to allow the next phase to begin. When we flooded the uh, excavation here, we then removed the two earth dams which are temporarily diverting the river into its temporary channel. Uh, once we've, we've removed the dams, we then block off each end of the temporary channel and get to work building a navigation channel and lock and extend the steel arch bridge over that structure. The idea behind the barrage is straightforward. Gates between the barrage piers can be raised to act like a canal lock and allow the level of the Tees in land to rise several feet to its present high water mark. They'll regulate the flow of water and isolate the river from tidal flows of sewage and industrial effluent. A road bridge will carry traffic over the barrage. By raising the river and isolating it from the sea, 11 miles of clean navigable water will be opened up for leisure pursuits. Despite the much vaunted environmental benefits, there are concerns that it could also have a detrimental effect. So for five years after it's opened, the river will be monitored to gauge the barrage's influence on bird and aquatic life. Another city centre improvement scheme has begun in earnest on the quayside in Newcastle. It will eventually create 300,000 square feet of office space, although just around the corner, existing offices stand empty. Simon Willis reports. Lord Mayor, champagne, cameras, all the trappings of a media event were at the start of this building project, which will cost £180 million and will create mainly office space. The first building is already let to an insurance firm, and the developers insist the space is urgently needed. In the last three years, office take-up, as they call it, has included 450,000 square feet in the Team Valley trading estate, 650,000 square feet in the Newcastle Business Park, and 120,000 square feet at Newcastle Central Park in the Manors area. There's only 80,000 square feet of quality office space available. That's according to letting agents Story Sons and Parker. Nevertheless, throughout the city centre, old offices stand empty, just streets away from where the new offices are being built. The developers argue that these don't have the easy access, the car parking and modern facilities which businesses demand, so they'll not move here. The older offices are now dilapidated. They, they've been declining for the last 20 years, and what hasn't happened is people being prepared to invest in them 
and improve them and make them attractive to occupiers. Uh, we see this as being the first step on Quayside to attracting inward investment. That will attract other investors to the city. It will create growth, increasing values, and that in itself, I hope and I think, will make it attractive for people to invest in places like Gray Street, Granger Street and Clayton Street so that the older buildings can be improved and refurbished. This is what the quayside could eventually look like, according to the developers. Rather than having existing Tyneside businesses relocate here, they'd prefer to persuade new companies to site their regional offices on the quayside. However, no one will be turned away. A consortium led by the breakaway Union of Democratic Mine Workers has emerged as the only bidder for Vane Tempest Colliery in County Durham. The consortium wouldn't resume mining there. Instead, it wants to set up a recycling plant which could employ several hundred people. But, as our industry correspondent Jackie Hodgson reports, there's already opposition. From this to this. Discussions between UDM Vista and carmakers BMW are already well advanced. If the plan goes ahead, a recycling operation like this prototype near Heathrow could take the place of pitheads on the County Durham coast. Alongside it, a covered operation to recycle household rubbish. British Coal has barred potential operators from talking about their plans, but earlier this year, the UDM Vista did explain its proposals as they applied to pits in the Midlands. People with a vision are now saying, now look, the colliery sites have a railhead infrastructure, they have the facilities there, the buildings there, people like uh, BMW have now indicated, Mayor Parry, Brown and Mason, the largest recycling uh, metal people in the UK, the French system bites of the French converter for household waste, which is totally environmentally friendly. They're interested. We have spoken to four government ministers. They're interested. What we're saying is before these things become derelict, before they just sink into oblivion, before the community is broken up, let's have the chance of creating an industry for the future. And let's face it, recycling is the future. But not everyone is as enthusiastic. The plan needs the backing of the local authority, in this case Easington Council, which has its own plans for housing and encouraging tourism in the area. Despite a public commitment to new enterprises bringing new jobs to CM, they're not convinced that this plan is the right one. We're interested in jobs. I wouldn't say we weren't interested, but we want jobs in the right place because we'd certainly like Easington to be a great place to live and work in the future, so the right jobs in the right places. And perhaps not surprisingly, at the TUC conference in Brighton, the NUM signalled its opposition to a plan promoted by its long-standing enemy. I'm certain in my own mind that there are many proposals which is coming forward by the local authorities, by the Northern Development Company, and by many other agencies in the region to redevelop the east of Durham. A waste disposal site would not be in the interest of the people of Seam nor of the environment of a beautiful seafront area, and we will be opposing it. On the streets of Seam, years of bitterness between the two unions brought a tough response. Well, I'm not interested in anything at the UDM. Why not, sir? I'm in UDM. You don't think it's a good idea? Yeah, I'm not ways back the project, no. <laughs> Is it because it's the UDM that's yes. involved? Why are you so anti the UDM? Why, well, yeah, um, politics, really. Sounds dirty. <laughs> We're just getting rid of them all. <laughs> <laughs> Coal mining in County Durham has certainly produced its share of muck in the past. Filthy beaches are a testament to that. But here, too, a legacy of pit closure. This plan, despite its political sensitivity, is the only one on the table. British Coal must now decide whether it will allow it the local authority whether it's acceptable. If it is, the UDM will find itself occupying some of the NUM's loyalist territory. Police on the Spanish holiday island of Mallorca are investigating the death of a three-year-old boy from Hartlepool who drowned in a swimming pool, apparently unnoticed by 300 people sunbathing nearby. From Spain, Tim Brown reports. The baby, Anthony Salvin, fell or wandered into the swimming pool, one of four, at a large holiday complex at Calas de Mallorca on the island's east coast. Vital minutes passed before he was spotted at the bottom of the pool and the alarm was raised. Although a doctor was giving first aid within five minutes, the baby died on his way to hospital in an ambulance. 
the baby's mother, who had only arrived with Anthony on holiday the previous day, was one of the sunbathers nearby. A police officer said that although the complex was a big one, it would remain a mystery that no one noticed the baby before it was too late. Cleveland police have started the process of repairing relations with the Ragworth community in Stockton, the scene of serious violence over the last few days. The divisional police commander, Bob Scott, faced a meeting of people on the estate this afternoon and listened to complaints about the way some of his officers had reacted. This report from Alan Powell. The meeting was attended by about 40 people, mainly mothers from the estate. They left without comment, but it had given them the chance to air their grievances about the police operation. They think the police think because a person lives on Ragworth, they must be guilty before they knock on the door. That's the idea that some of the people have of the police. I don't believe that is the case, but people have that perception, and that perception has got to be knocked down. And that message has got through to the police? I think that message has got through very, very clearly. I said to Bob Scott immediately after the meeting, what one word came across to you today? And he said, attitude, the attitude of my officers. Cleveland's chief constable, Barry Shaw, says allegations of heavy-handedness will be investigated, but he says the complaints must be set in the context of a large number of plaudits received by the police. Ragworth was a serious situation and required a quick and firm response. Nevertheless, the weekend of violence was a blow to the senior officer of the community policing programme who was on leave at the time. Personally, I was disappointed because uh, it is alien to my way of policing that officers have to be dressed in protective uh, gear. And uh, yes, I was extremely concerned about uh, the relationship with the community because the meeting we've just had confirms again that 98% of the people on this estate have the same interests that we have, and that is ridding this estate of those few who just want to cause trouble for their own ends. Even the government's own research now points to the fact there's a very clear link between poverty, uh, deprivation, poor housing and crime. And those sorts of problems have got to be addressed, otherwise the police will be left fighting along the thin blue line. But Housing Minister Sir George Young, who was also in Stockton today, celebrating the achievements of urban investment, refused to see Ragworth as anything but a law and order problem. These estates have had investment from uh, central government through estate action. They're also getting investment through city challenge. So I don't think it is the case that these estates are estates that have been neglected in terms of public investment. I regard it primarily as a law and order matter rather than a housing matter. When it's completed, this new neighbourhood centre will have a vital role to play in uniting the people of Ragworth. The anger generated by the events of this weekend has, to some extent, dissipated, but it's clear that much hard work is still needed by both the police and the community before both sides are united against the criminals. Meanwhile, trouble is never far away on Stockton's neighbouring estates. At Blue Hall last night, a car was rammed against a news agents and set alight. Firefighters who arrived were stoned by groups of youths and had to be protected by police called in from nearby Ragworth. Well, back now to our reports on the start of the new school term, which we began yesterday with Northern Line. In Cumbria, children returned last week to schools facing severe financial hardship. A survey of over 300 schools has highlighted the problems, made worse because 15 have opted out of council control, taking £3 million from the county's budget. As Judy Ingham reports, many now rely on parental contributions. It doesn't cost much to buy a Bunsen burner, but the range of laboratory equipment needed adds up to hundreds of pounds, and in this school, much of it's been bought with money raised by parents. They've even paid for much of the refurbishment at the school. Well, over the last few years, they've contributed substantial funds to, to our school budget, uh, funds that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to achieve. Uh, it's, broadly speaking, between something like £6,000 and £10,000 a year that they've contributed. One fundraiser is even going to run in the New York Marathon to raise £4,000 for the school's library extension. The neighbouring primary school can't balance the books either, as the county council implements cuts in education, totalling £850,000. There are now fewer teachers, and a quarter of schools have also lost non-teaching staff. 
we're in a classroom now with a year group that last year would have been organised into perhaps 2022 maximum within the class because it's a practical music class. This year this class is running at 24, 25. Over the last 12 months we've had a reduction of five full-time equivalent teachers in this school and that's against the background of increasing pupil numbers and I would think that that would be a fairly common feature in all large comprehensive schools within the county. The education is still being provided at adequate levels for the children but it's, it's, there's bound to be a stage where further cutbacks in expenditure is going to have a direct effect on what the, te the children learn in school and uh, we're worried about that. Officers say the hidden impact of current budget cuts could be felt in LEA schools in a matter of months. The Director of Education has today warned of significant further cuts of a large but unpredictable scale. Well, the only school in the North East to have opted out so far has been told that its local authority is withdrawing support services. Astley Community High School at Seaton Delaval, which breaks free from Northumberland County Council next month, will now have to organise its own cleaning, payroll and school meals. Tony Baker reports. It was the first day back at lessons for 658 pupils here today. They've had a welcome break in the middle of a tough year during which the school has fought its way through parental ballots and a high court action to win grant maintained or self-governing status. Now staff have been told key support services from Northumberland County Council will be withdrawn. The services worth up to £150,000 a year will be phased out from October the 1st when Astley Community High School officially becomes self-governing. From then on the school will have to organise its own insurance, cleaning, caretaking, payroll and school meals. I think the Northumberland are missing an opportunity. In looking for these services around the country we find that authorities like Cumbria and Lincolnshire are offering services to grant maintained schools. And in fact, Lincolnshire has set up and is running an extra business as a result. They supply services to 70 grant-maintained schools around the country. And so they've brought business into Lincolnshire as a result. Northumberland County Council says it isn't worried about the loss of income to Lincolnshire. And the vice chairman of its education committee, Councillor Ted Weeks, also chairman of Astley's governors until October the 1st, denies it's an act of political vindictiveness. No, really it's, it's um, having faith with the schools which have stayed with the county council. We believe our primary duty is to those more than 200 schools who wish to have a partnership with the County Council and will be providing services to them. As far as Astley is concerned, the County Council will provide the services which it's um, duty bound by law to provide and will provide those well and will also provide a youth and community service which is something which we feel very strongly should exist in the area. But as for the other services, this was clear all along that if the school opted out then they would be going into the marketplace for these services. Changes in support services will be phased in between now and next March. The County Council has decided it will continue to run a youth club and evening classes at Astley, paying charges to the school while doing so. Well, now back to the lead story about nearly 300 people being led from the Thorpe nuclear plant at Sellafield. We're now going back to Andrew Hartley, the news editor of Radio Cumbria in Carlisle. Andrew, is there any more news? Few details emerging um, as we've been on air. We know that the gas was nitrogen oxide, that it was released into the atmosphere, it, that it is not a radioactive gas, that part of the plant was immediately evacuated, that some 280 people in all. Of those, a small number received medical attention. Um, they included uh, one of the company's own firemen, we don't think that any of them uh, were suffering major problems. We think uh, that none were in fact um, sent to hospital as a result of this. What we also know is that the plant has been ventilated um, and is due to resume testing about now. Well, what happens next? Presumably there will be some sort of inquiry. We think that an investigation into this, what will be a, an embarrassing episode for BNFL, will start tomorrow. Andrew, thank you very much indeed again.
We move on now to the weather forecast from John Clapham. Thanks, Mike. There hasn't been as much uh, heavy rain in the southwest of Britain today as I'd expected to see, but even so, there has been some. Uh, it probably bodes well for the region, uh, not seeing too much rain in the next 24 hours, but I think there will be some significant rain to watch out for. It's getting into the region fairly soon, actually, as you will see on the first picture for tonight. Rain and cloud getting into the south of the region. It will continue to move northwards as the evening and night goes on. I think by the end of the night we could well see some heavy bursts of rain, particularly in the south. Temperatures will hold up fairly well. I don't think we'll see anything below about 12 degrees overnight. That's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And there will be quite a fresh uh, breeze blowing from the east. And for tomorrow's weather, I think it's going to be a cloudy picture right across the, uh, the north of England with some bursts of heavy rain to watch out for still in the morning. I think we tend to find as the day goes on there will be some better conditions, a slow improvement in the south uh, with brighter skies and uh, perhaps uh, rather less in the way of rain in the second half of the day. But even so, don't expect too much uh, of an improvement, don't expect a lot of sunshine for instance, and so it won't do a great deal for the temperatures. The best we'll see probably is 17 in the far south of the region, that's 63 Fahrenheit. Further north a little bit cooler, particularly where you're near the east coast and the breeze is still blowing in quite fresh from the North Sea. Beyond that, I think we're going to go into a showery few days. A little bit warmer, I think, but still, as I say, rather unsettled. Thanks very much, John. Well, now look at tonight's headlines. The Labour leader, John Smith, has said there will be no compromise in his plans to reform the party's links with the unions and scrap the bloc vote. The government is considering cutting the red tape which governs safety regulations in old people's homes. Labour says the move could turn homes into fire traps. Nearly 300 people have been evacuated from the Thorpe reprocessing plant at Sellafield this afternoon. British nuclear fuels say there's been a release of non-radioactive nitrogen oxides. And that's Look North tonight. Until tomorrow, 6.30. Good night. <laughs>